Good evening. Good evening to all Ruth Radio listeners. And it's so such a pleasure to have you on this evening. We thank you for joining us. And, you know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't you, if it wasn't your, um, your interest and your prayer and, you know, your, just being yourself. We really appreciate each and every listener, wherever you're listening to us from, um, at home in Trinidad and Tobago or abroad, wherever you're listening to us from, we want to say thank you so much for being with us this evening, this Friday evening on Growth Radio. Thank you for choosing us, you know, and this evening, you know, as every Friday, we have uh, a very wonderful, interesting guests that talk about their BC and their AD lives, you know, their lives before Christ and their lives after they met they had an encounter with this Christ that we talk so much about. And we have, uh, we, we were with this person last week, please God. And if you remember, if you weren't able to take in that interview, you can go on to our YouTube page, Growth Live Stream, and you will be able to get uh, a review. You can see the replay of that interview. And he's here with us again from Lowlands, Tobago, and it's no other than Mr. Dion D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza, welcome to Growth Radio, interview with the exes. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's so good to have you again. Thank you. I know you're a busy man. I mean, Mr. D'Souza is a very, very busy man. Other than being a father, He's a husband, he's a farmer as well. So he's a hard working man. And we appreciate you, Mr. D'Souza, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us this evening. All right. So, you know, last week, you know, you were very open and thank you for your openness and, and sharing with us your story, your history. And, you know, it really was encouraging because what it showed me is that it doesn't matter how far, how deep you've gone, that you're not, you're not, you're not, um, you know, God can still save you. God can still take you from a far distance and bring you to a good place. To, he has a good future for us. And it looks like you are enjoying the good future that God speaks about in Jeremiah 29, 11. Is that so? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So tell us a little bit again, for those who did not, um, who, who wasn't able to take in the program last week, tell us a little bit more about yourself from your mouth. I don't want to hear my voice for a little while. Tell us about Dion D'Souza from, from the horse's mouth. Okay. Good afternoon to all listeners, uh, near and far, international, local, regional. I am Dion D'Souza and I, I always like to say that I'm a recovering addict. I am a, a, a family man, a father of two, a husband. I'm also a businessman. I buy and sell. And I am also a child of God, most important. Most important. That is most important. And what does that being a child of God mean? I mean, they're not, everyone on this, this platform are not children of God. So they might not know what you mean. And some persons believe that they are, even though they haven't accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. But what does that mean personally for you? What does that mean? What does that do for you to be a child of God? Um, it's, it, it simply means for me that 
or I know personally, I know the relationship that I have developed with God and his son, Jesus Christ. I also, I am also standing on the promises that he made for us. He, he also, um, he also gave us the Holy Spirit that is going to testify on our behalf that we are children of God and I stand by those promises. So, yes, I am a child of God because I serve him, I worship him. I, I am not a perfect man, but I, I stand in the promises of God and I believe in him, I trust in him, I live for him. So by saying that and by doing that, I am a child of God. All right, thank you so much for sharing that. And just to be very, very clear, Yes, um, we are, while we all want to consider that we are children of God, God gives us the opportunity to say yes to him, to be his child. It's very similar to the adoption process in the natural. You know, you have to have consent by both parties. God has already consented. God wants to be our father, but we have to consent to be his child. You know, he gives us that freedom he gives us the choice to choose him he has already chosen each and every one of us those born those who are still to be born he has chosen us all all right so we have once we are of sound mind we have a right to to choose or to reject his invitation to become part of his family and the only way we can do that is through his son jesus whom he sent um, as an ambassador. Well he, is, well, he is God in essence as well, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. And in that, that manner, he was able to pay a price that we couldn't, all right? So we, once we accept that price, that finished work on the cross that Christ Jesus did, once we believe what Jesus has done on the cross, God says that we have the right to become children of God. That's a right. People call, people talk about human rights and all kind of rights, right? Left, right, and center, right, Mr. D'Souza? That's right, yes. <laughs> There's an eternal right. I call it an eternal right. It's a spiritual right, an eternal right to become a child of God. Okay? Legitimately. <laughs> right? And, um, just, to, just to add to what you're saying, too, there are certain... Um, there are certain things that you would experience that is going to indicate that to you. For example, um, the Holy Spirit is there to, 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 to bring us to consciousness whenever we sin. So immediately we ask for forgiveness and we try not to, or we try to make a difference, or we try to develop ourselves from that particular instance, not wanting to go back there, even though we end up back there, it simply shows, it, it shows where the Holy Spirit is dealing with us, convicting us every time we do something wrong. And that is what he will, because we gave God our heart and our soul and asked him to be a part of our lives, the Holy Spirit can now convict us and instruct us and discipline us and teach us and motivate us and show us this and you went wrong, ask for forgiveness. And I've had an instance where a vendor stole a bag of, sweet potato for me recently and i was is the first man i said god is the first man i was ever able to to forgive so fast you know my my apologies yes yeah, so he stole the bag of potato from me and um i was able to forgive him so fast and I know that that is the Holy Spirit. And there was this guy, he cursed me and he told me, he said, boy, use that old piper. It hurt me. Eh? But before I left there, I said to him, I said, Steve, I forgive you. And I also told him, I said, you are the first person I ever forgive so fast. And up to today, to me, I forgive them. You understand? So all of that is indications as to who you are now and who you are led by. And when you are led by the Holy Spirit, these things become easy. I tell you, you have people who I want to go and have conversation with who I haven't spoken for 15 years. And it was so easy week before last week to forgive that person for what, for those two persons or what they did. 
Awesome. That's not an easy thing. And as you said, it has to be God. We, a, a lot of times in this world, in this earth, we go through so many difficult things that we need something more than our human effort, more than our will to be able to, to, to allow us to do that which is right in God's sight, that which is righteous. And it's not easy. So that's why we need that supernatural help from the Father, from the Holy Spirit to give us the strength. The word of God says we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. And we need that strength because yes. it's not easy dealing with human beings like ourselves, right? <laughs> And you know, Mr. D'Souza, that's such an interesting thing, what you just said, and that guy that called you our old piper, you know, that is so much like the enemy of our soul, so much like Satan to try and throw old things, try and throw the past back into our face, right? And, you know, I'm glad that you said you were able to forgive him. And why is it you were able to forgive him? What does your relationship with God have to do with you being able to forgive that man? It's, it's simple what he asks us to do. It, it, it's just simple. He asks us to, 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 to forgive those who trespass against us, yeah. that we might be forgiven also. Right. So it, it's all about, for me, it's all about obedience. I want to learn to obey God. I want to, I want to obey him. I have to obey him. You know, and, and um, praying and fasting is what really gives me the breakthroughs in these instances, you know. Um, thank God for his mercy and I, you know um, I just want to obey him and do what is right according to what he wants and I'm um, looking at the, the, I was looking at a movie Life of Jesus Christ East, on Easter weekend and they were beating him and doing him so much things and he still was able to forgive them you understand so I want to be like that. I know I can't be like that, but, you know, I want to be the type of person that is ready to forgive. Right. And you know what I'm hearing, Mr. D'Souza, of you wanting to be like your savior, of you wanting to be like your father, is love. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the main ingredient in all of this thing, you know. If you don't have love, you would not be able to forgive. If you have not received the supernatural, inescapable, beautiful, matchless love of God through his son, Jesus, these things that we're talking about now is going to be difficult. Yes. It's going to be difficult just trying to do it in your own strength by willpower, right? And I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, for addiction, and, you know, you, we spoke last week that you overcame addiction, you, were, you are a survivor, you are a thriver, not only a survivor, but you are a thriver. Now that you are, now you are thriving, you have the abundant, you are experiencing the abundant life that Jesus died so that you could live, right? Yes. And I want you to tell us about that, that addiction, that, what does that do to a man when you are addicted to something? I mean, what does that do to a human? What does that do to a person? Addiction is like a is like a god, and you are the slave, right? You do anything. You do. Addiction keeps you in a stronghold. It's like a strong man. It's like it's like it don't matter about of, of it doesn't matter your greatest efforts. You're still not gonna survive addiction. You're still not gonna make it true unless <clears throat> you try Jesus, unless you try to serve God in the way, in the right way. Yeah. Um, addiction is an obsessive and compulsive disorder. It's a yeah. disorder that keeps you captive. Yes. And it keeps you in denial. It keeps you in fear. It also prevents you from recognizing anything that makes sense, anything that is true. So, Wow. It, it binds, binds you. you. And, yes. And have you, like, you, you can't help yourself. But for me, when I started using, well, um, I, I used my one for 25 odd years. And I tell you, it, it was better. It was a better 25 years than the five years I used crack cocaine for. So it's two different drugs. Okay. Two different 
behavior, but the yeah. addiction remained the same. Yeah. I wasn't able to go to work. It it it, it creates a lot of absenteeism. I lost my job smoking marijuana. Yeah. Because of absenteeism, because of lack of performance. Um, well, crack cocaine took everything. I became a semi-vegant in less than six weeks and practically a, a vegan in 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 three months, four months. Wow. Right? Um yeah. What addiction does, addiction causes you to lose your family, wow. your friends, your respect, your morals, My goodness. your values. It takes everything from you. You no longer have anything at all to hold on to more than the substance mm -hmm. because you're in that state of addiction. And even when you're in treatment, yeah. You find yourself suffering from the mental aspect of addiction. You might not be using the substance, but the mental aspect of the addiction still lingers. So you, you, you're dealing with thoughts, you're dealing with behaviors, yeah. you're dealing with associations that you would have made along the way. Mm -hmm. And all these things hold, hold, hold on to addiction. And another thing that holds on to addiction is your past life. Right. For example, my father was very abusive to my mother. He used to beat my mother and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. The counselors will share with me and tell me that I need to let out these things because addiction thrives on these things. Mm. Okay, your father did not do well in his family, mash up the family. That could work on uh, against you as a reason to use. Okay. You understand? Mm. So all these things or things that I needed to deal with because addictions hold on to these past past behaviors. Yes, I didn't grow up with my mother. I didn't grow up with my father. So I use drugs because I study in them. Okay. You know, okay so these okay. are some of the things that addiction hold on to. Right. Um, it's an obsessive mm -hmm. and comp compulsive disorder. So it deals with the thinking of the mind. And you know, according to the Bible, we lose the battle when we lose our mind. Right. And addiction takes your mind. Mm. Wow. So I'm hearing so many things from you, Mr. D'Souza, that this addiction problem that many of us, I mean, silently or openly, um, we do carry. Uh, we, it is a burden that a lot of us carry. Um, it says, you're saying that it blinds you to the truth. Mm -hmm. It steals from you. So it's a thief. It enslaves yes, it you, so it's yes. a it's a, a, a um what you call it an slave oppressor, master. It's a slave master, yes. and you're saying that um people hold on to it to try to fill some kind of void that they have on the yes. inside. I haven't heard any benefits yes. so far of addiction. Are there any benefits to addiction? No, there's 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 no benefit to addiction. Only if. You're addicted to reading the Bible. <laughs> you could, you probably you might find some some benefits there. <laughs> All but, right, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> but um, in the, um, now there are, there are so many different types of addiction. There are process addiction, which is um, sex gambling. What addiction? Eating, did you, I'm sorry. Are, what did you call it? What kind of addiction is it? Process. Process. P R O C E S S. Yes, process addiction. I've not heard that term before. Right. Um, the, the, the process addiction is, is sex. So why you call um, it process? No, I don't understand. Why you call it right. process okay, Because it's two different. Um, sex is a process. You have to make love. Uh -huh. Then you have to, or you have to stimulate the woman. You have to carry her out. You have to make love. Oh. Then you have sex. That is the process. Oh. Gambling is a process because it's an action right eating is an eating disorder but it's also an action you have to prepare the food to eat it so it takes a process hmm. but substance abuse mm -hmm. or substance misuse is when you it's not a process it's 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 a mind thing it's the brain you deal with now so when you use crack cocaine or marijuana or alcohol it affects the brain the, psych, the, the biopsychosocial aspect of your life. Mm. You understand? So it affects the brain. Whereas sex deals with only pleasure. You understand? Interesting. I, hmm. 
I know, I know. I, 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 will, I will ponder on it some more. I'm not as I'm not as intelligent as you, but I will um I will think on it. I will listen back to this tape and and do some research as well to try and get that's, a better understanding. That's right. That's right. Because I want yeah. to understand. Yeah, I want to understand. Okay. So there are no benefits to addiction. So then benefits. Why else do people become addicted? What are some reasons? I mean, I know we spoke about one. You said that you didn't have your parents, so you know you felt abandoned mm -hmm. you felt rejected. You know that that void inside of you. So what? What else? Well, um, basically, it's it's like um, yes, rejection is one. Um, a guy might lose his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Um, he might start feeling lonely. He might try to get her back, and she don't want him back, and. He use drugs. Some right. people use drugs because of peer influence. Right. Right. Some people use drugs because it's recreational. Okay. They um no one goes along asking for an addiction. You understand? Addiction okay. is a disease. So when it starts recreational, yeah. you go and you take a two drink and you take a smoke by the partner and everything go well and right. everything is well and before you could recognize you become addicted, you're already addicted. But the um the scientists and they they say addiction is based on a year doing the same substance. That is how they diagnose you from as as being addicted. But to me, addiction starts to me, for me, it started automatically. But they are um, also saying, in my case, it was my, it was just a change of drug, a drug of choice. But so, but, but um, you know, it 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 truly affects the mind, it truly affects the body. And as as long as as an individual you're having challenges and you're accustomed to drinking and smoking, you're gonna continue doing that and become addicted, and you don't know. You can become addicted and not know that you're addicted. Yes, you don't know that you're addicted. Okay. So um, how can persons know, come to that realization that they are addicted to something? All right. Um, absenteeism is one. It starts showing up in your job. That's one. You start reaching to work late because you have to take a smoke before you reach to work. Okay. And sometimes if you ain't take that smoke, you ain't leaving home because your body need that smoke. Oh. Two, um, your body becomes dependent on the substance. Mm. So you have to get a smoke to function as, as, as a normal person. Okay. Um, you also, you will recognize that you start using much more the substance. So before you were using a toothpick, then you are, now we start using a pen. Mm. And we start using a ruler. Yeah. So you recognize the, the, the progression to addiction, the stages, you start using more. That means the tolerance for your body starts developing for this substance. Right. So the more you use, the more you have to use in order to get the desired effect. All these are indications and red flags that you are an addict. And most, one of the things that you would hear a lot of smokers and drinkers say mm -hmm. is that I really want to stop smoking a boy, but they're not stopping. It's, it's because they cannot stop on their they own. They can't, right. That is, wow, that is very sad. It sounds like a trap. Yes, it is. My God. So how can... Okay, so I've got two questions. One, how can family members support this person um, in their state of addiction, that's one. And then how, what's the, the most important step for an addict towards recovery? Okay, um, I'll start with the second question first. The um, first step, an addict has to admit that he's powerless over his addiction and he has to come to this place where he recognizes that his life has become unmanageable. That is the first step. Admitting that you're powerless. When you admit that you're powerless, it means that you're asking for help. Right? It means that you give up, you give in. Right? And, and you have to recognize that your life has become unmanageable. In other words, you stop going to work. You stop providing food for the home. 
you're thiefing, you're, so you're stealing, right? Um, you're doing all sorts of things to get this substance. All of that is unmanageability. Nothing that you used to do before makes you happy anymore. You're now, you're now a prisoner to the substance. So you act like the substance. The substance is one that will compel you to steal and you will steal. I stole too. I, I, I thank God I didn't end up in prison, but I did some stealing too, because that is what it does. Yeah. Um, it doesn't sound like a nice place to be for anybody, for anybody, you know? Um, so then the second question then, so if the person then admits, and even if they don't admit, who can, what, what, what is the right response of those that love that, that person? Um, the, the, the family members need to educate themselves about what addiction is. Okay. And I have a saying, you change Education. how you look at things when you change what you, you change what you see when you change how you look at things. So if the family members could become more aware and more educated about what addiction is, they'll recognize that the family members are totally helpless. Yeah. Yes, you could blame them for taking the initial steps, which is to start. Yeah. But when it becomes a disease, it's like cancer, it's like diabetes, they are no longer in control of that mental illness okay it's a mental and a physical illness because the body calling for it and the mind calling for it so what the parents what the family members have to do is part is get it get educated get informed get get the knowledge and the understanding as to what addiction is mm -hmm. and how to go about helping this person what worked for me is my mother start giving me tough love okay and she, but she was in America all this time, but she, she gave me tough love. She, she said to me, she said, Dion, I wouldn't let you kill me. Oh. Don't call me back until you get yourself together. I never got myself together. However, she came and she asked me if I wanted to go to Arriva and I said, yes. And that's how I ended up in Arriva. So, so, you know, I thank God for her. I thank God that and another thing, all recovering addicts is a is a is a reflection of what God wants for you. You just didn't come off the street or come off the block just like that. God had a hand to play in that. First hand that played was God's hand. Hey Amen. And thank God for that. And you know, yeah. I'm I'm glad that you said that because sometimes people don't know who to trust. But I would like to, to, to posit to persons that are listening that God is trustworthy. You can trust God. He is the only person that will never leave you, that will never let you down. You know, yes. he is a man. He is a God of his word. And haven't you seen God being faithful to you, Mr. D'Souza? He has been faithful to me from the first day I was born. And I was too young to see it. <laughs> yeah. But um, I got into drug addiction, marijuana addiction, crack cocaine addiction, and alcohol. Call it a poly addict. And I tell I you, I didn't know that. That's a new word for me, a poly addict. It would make sense because poly and, and everything else means yeah. it's plural. It's numerous, right? <laughs> numerous. Yes, yes. But you are a poly addict. So drugs. You had the cocaine, you had the marijuana, cigarettes, the cigarettes, um, alcohol, alcohol, the sex. Well, wow. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. okay. So, so um, I um, I felt his presence. I I I I knew that I wanted to live for him because. I couldn't find a way out. There was never a way out. I couldn't see, even while I was in the program, I wasn't seeing a way. It was still dark and void while being in the program. I just couldn't see how I was stopping because the, the, oh. as I tell you, addiction wow. is a mental thing. Yeah. Even when you're using drugs, addiction still progresses. Yeah. You understand? 
because mm. it deals with lifestyle, attitude, behaviors, you know, and these were the changes that I needed to make. Those mm -hmm. changes won't come in two months. You know, two months is just really to catch your physical health. Right. The, the mental aspect of the recovery hasn't started yet. So you're still struggling with thinking and behaviors and associations. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't see my way out. I couldn't, I wanted to stop and I just couldn't stop. Wow. So I depended on the Lord wholly and solely for me to stop. And wow. I did fasting in the rehab. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. went to every prayer session in the rehab, My different God. groups came in and I started developing and developing and getting stronger and stronger mm -hmm. and starting to know who I am and my role. And I started to go to secondary schools. I started to go to orientations and mm -hmm. the, the Lord opened all these doors to strengthen me and to show me, look, I am using you. I am helping yeah. you. I am teaching you. Yeah. Go and help people. Go and teach right. people. Go right. and tell people. And this is why I'm here speaking to you today, because I've been doing this since in the rehab. Mm -hmm. you know? That's incredible, Dion. So, I mean, now that, I mean, we're coming out of um, lockdown phase. Um, so are you, do you have other, as you said, do you have other um, appointments to, to do these, these talks and stuff at schools online or what are you doing now? Well, as, as long as I'm, well, as I am always available, I am a part of uh, a, rehab, a rehab group called Changing Lanes. Changing Lanes. Changing Lanes. Okay. You could go on Facebook and, and um, check it out. I'm a part of Changing Lanes. And one of my responsibilities in Changing Lanes is to, I always go and share my story. So wherever we have groups, um, community programs where we go and enlighten the community about addiction and what drugs is and stuff like that. I do yeah. that. Yeah. And I also do um I'm not qualified to, to 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 do particular programs. So I don't do it, but I know I have the capacity to do it. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So persons can go and find you and your group on Changing Lanes on Facebook. That's Changing Lanes, Changing on, lanes yes. on Facebook. So they can yes. get some more information and perhaps some replays of, of, of the videos and stuff that the talks that you've had in the past. Um, I can't remember. We haven't any any recorded i don't think we have any recorded oh. but you should see a picture with the group that's one of the things that you you should see there okay um and you would see some stuff there but we 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 end meet the stage where we have a recording system and a recording personnel and anyone that did you um did you tips or programs and stuff like that yet but it's there Okay. It's functional, okay. and we are growing as, as you speak. All right. So what assistance is it that you, you need to, to make this group grow more other than, so you said video, videographers, perhaps. What else yes. do you all need? We need, um, we need more members. Yes, yes. We need more members. We need a platform where we can reach, you know, where we can reach beyond Tobago, I would like to say, you know, um, we're still in the process of getting a facility where we can have an in-house program, where we can have residents, we call them residents. And these residents are the people who are suffering from drugs and addiction, right? So we, we, still, we are still in the process of getting a, a residential, um, facility but for, for now we do um outreach programs we also have the narcotics anonymous program where addicts can come and get assistance until we can get this in-house program on stream so you're saying that there are two um options for persons who are suffering um from yes. 
from addictions. One is changing lanes and the other one for those who are addicted to drugs of any sort. Is it Narcotics, Narcotics Anonymous? Anonymous. Yes, yes. So that is also on Facebook? No, Narcotics, Narcotics Anonymous is an anonymous program. You know, um, it's not a program. All right, where... it shouldn't be on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Facebook. Yes, yes. Okay. So then how could, well then, how do people how do people know get to um get the help from narcotics anonymous be how do the addicts get the help from the narcotics anonymous we seek them out you seek and, them out yes and most of the time they know the center because relapse is very 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 prevalent amongst what? addicts yes why why is relapse prevalent if they've gone why why because addiction is a mental disease and if you don't deal with the mental aspect of it a lot of addicts deal with the physical aspect of it which is the biological aspect of it the, the body doesn't call for the substance anymore but the mind which is the psychological aspect of it needs to be treated you understand and if that doesn't if it doesn't work on that you're only doing a physical rehabilitation but the psychological aspect of it still continues. That is why for me, if I if I start looking at pornographies and stuff like that, it opens addiction once more. Psychologically, my physical body hasn't started calling for it because I haven't touched it. But the mental aspect of it starts to operate again because I allow old nature the old man to come back in yeah yeah and you know when mr dion speaks about the old man it's he's, he's talking about the person the people we were before we met christ before christ right. touched our minds and healed our souls and he healed our spirits right that's the, right, person, yes. the people we, the, the the what the old piper yes that is, that's what we were before right we yeah. all had a before those who are in christ now all had a before right That's whether right. it's our old pipe our old teeth whatever it was it was something we was all yes, there yes, yes. <laughs> right and um i want to say thank you that is a very very important issue because the mind as you i mean i'm sure lots of our listeners have heard the the the, the phrase the mind is a battlefield yes. right so do you all have psychologists do you all have persons or do you all need you all do you, is there something that you all need um, to help these persons not relapse? Um, <laughs> re, relapse, relapse, based, relapse is based on the individual. 90% of the work that has to be done has to be done by the individual. 10% is the facilitators, which is going to be the psychologists, the counselors, and your peers, right? You have to want that change first and foremost in order for it to happen, in order for it to take place. The psychologist could say everything, could do everything, could root out everything. If you have reservations, if you still have, I want to still go down the corner. If you want to be a part of the world and partake in these things, addiction, is right there waiting to pounce on the very, very first opportunity it gets. You understand? So 90% of the work has to be done by you. And in my time, there was a checklist for readiness. And it deals with three aspects of your life, the physical aspect, the psychological aspect, and the, and the, um, the social aspect. If you doesn't have these three aspects covered, you're going to struggle. The physical aspect is your physical body. How you feel within your body? Do you feel well? Are you strong? Are you healthy? The psychological aspect is how have you been able to deal with challenges? Did you build your res resilience? Did you develop humility? Did you accept that you're powerless over your addiction and your life has become unmanageable? Did you make amends with the people you have hurt? You understand? These are some of the things that you have to look at psychologically socially you have to identify with your family how do they um, receive you 
Do they understand what you're going through? The relationship that you have with them, was it broken? How do you intend to mend this relationship? Was this relationship mended? And when you deal with these issues, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's easier to walk back into society and start functioning as a normal human being. Because if you go back into society and your mother reject you, if you didn't deal with resilience, being able to bounce back, coping mechanisms, using these coping mechanisms, what will happen? You will result to using drugs again because that is where you will find comfort. That's what you knew for the past 20 years. So there are certain things that has to be done in order for the addict to actually develop himself and actually be able to manage life on life terms. He needs a support system. And if that is not in place, then you are not ready to leave the rehab center because your support system is very important. I would I would have to agree with that, you know, because you need the strength of a family, you need the strength of a community to be That's able to um to really beat this. It, as you said, it's a disease. So just like cancer or anything else, you need that support, to, you know, to help your mind, to help your brain, to help your system, you know, really fight against the enemy. It's it is an enemy, it right? Is, is. And um, I like you know, you said something really important that you know it's it's like a temptation to go back to to something that you know you know those old habits as your, your mom and your dad and your grandparents you say old habits die hard <laughs> you know and you, you want to go back to those things that are familiar those things that give you comfort and this is something that i learned some years ago that you know as human beings a lot of times we look for comfort in the wrong places yes. false comfort is what um they had called it in my time right and actually what that false comfort is is an idol <laughs> yes it is whatever yes. it is it's an idol you know because you have replaced that food that sex that drugs that tv whatever it is you have put that on the pedestal of your heart instead of god yes. you know as you said at the beginning of the the interview you said the addiction is like a god <laughs> yes yes right yes. and um and what the thing with gods is that they want all of you they want all your attention they want all of you they want all of you you know and from what you were describing you know these addictions it's all consuming you know it affects every part of your life mind yes. body spirit soul work everything it affects everything negatively yes and 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 and, and your family members also suffer a lot as you yeah? they right. may not suffer the, the actual use but they suffer the grief they suffer seeing you looking the way you're looking because you know mm. you, you should see what vagrant is look you know um they suffer trying to spend the last money to carry to a rehab yeah fifteen thousand dollars for six months and after wow. six months you fall back into the same behavior oh my again. gosh that's tough so they suffer a lot too they suffer a lot so what do you think what do you think that um communities, the church, um, the government can do in order to, to mitigate um, the effects of addiction? How, what can we do to, to stop persons from even choosing um, you know, this route? Is there anything that families can do, communities can do, governments can do? Um... I think the first thing that has to be done is to parents should learn to create an environment for their children mm. and developing a strong family, a spiritual family, a godly family is what is going to break that cycle. Why I say that is, um, my children, they are young. Yes. And I want to develop a godly cycle, a godly life. Yeah. That they can grow into that. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead me as to how to groom them. 
and how to develop them. Now, I depend on him, the Holy Spirit, for everything. Yes. I say, Holy Spirit, show me what to do. Tell me what man. to do. Yeah. Help me with this. I always say that whether I've seen him do it or not, yeah. but it always works out that way. And we need healthy conversations with our children. We need to spend a lot of time in the world, start praying with them, start teaching them, start educating them, having them learn to depend on God, learn to pray. And that is one thing that can be done. So in, in terms of the government, what the government need to do is institute addiction programs in schools so that they can bring these young children, bring them to the awareness of what addiction is and how you can become addicted. When I started to smoke marijuana and cigarettes, I was a teenager. An older teen, he found some and we started using. Some stayed on, some didn't. I stayed on for 20 years after. Some didn't stay on at all, right? And if I was educated about, hello, if you use marijuana, you could become addicted. Um, there's no guarantee how you're going to stop. Don't use it because look at the examples here. These are people who we knew and they died. They couldn't stop smoking. They couldn't stop drinking. Education is very important. So the government needs to have this in the curriculum, the school curriculum, educating youth about addiction and what causes addiction and identify the different type of drugs. And some people just don't start, just, just don't start. Once you don't start, you don't have an issue. You understand? And um, you have to be able to identify what addiction is and deal with it before it becomes too tough for you to handle. And most times, addiction is not a one-man process. You can't handle it on your own. And that is one thing addiction does. It keeps us in denial. Yeah, man, I can handle it. I can stop when I'm ready. I can stop just now, man. Don't worry, man. I can see about that. And that is called denial. You understand? So that is one of the things addiction does. So it, you become deluded. <laughs> you're, de yes. you're delusional about yes, your, delusional. your position. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and that is, that is, well, that's dangerous. Yes, yes. That's dangerous because you're lying to yourself, really, honestly. And it's, it's not going to help anybody. And, you know, I like that you brought your children into, into this um, discussion, Mr. Dion, because our children are our legacy. And yes. what is the legacy that we really want to leave for our children? What, how do we want our children to see us? You know, talk, talk a little bit more about that because, you know, the Bible speaks about self-control. You know, that's one of the, the fruit of the spirit, right? Self-control among other things. And, you know, the, the, the word of God has a lot to say about self-control. And, you know, in this world, that we're living in today it says the mantra the common mantra is do as thy will you know the satanist alistair crawley he is the one that uh, made that that phrase popular which of course is an anti-christ phrase because of course jesus when he was at gethsemane he you know he, before he went to the cross he was saying god not my will but yours be done you know but then you have this cult <laughs> that's now saying do as thy will do what you please do what do what you want i mean we even have the calypso do what you want yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's doing what you want without consequence a lot of consequences lots of a lot, consequences. A lot of consequences yes. yeah because when you want to do what you want you're going to do the wrong things you're going to do things that is not pleasing to god and pleasing to man mm -hmm. Yeah, and you wouldn't have any conviction of them because you want to do what you want. You when want to do what you want. When you're doing what is required of you to do, yeah. then you start speaking about discipline. Then you start speaking about understanding. Then you start speaking about listening. Then you start speaking about nurturing. And you are being led by the Holy Spirit, which He is nurturing you. And you have to then pass that on to your children. 
I was funnily, as you say, you asked that question, I was talking to a policeman Friday. We grew up together and no talk bring to work and I was telling him, I said, no, I don't mind telling my children the life that I lived before. And he said, no, he said he would never tell his children the life that he lived. And I studied the whole weekend and, you know, I came up with the answer and I said, you know, I shouldn't tell them either. Because you, you said my, that? No, yes, I said it in my heart that yeah. you know, I shouldn't tell you. Yes, no, no, but you that know, guy was no. ashamed. Are you ashamed of the past? I mean, he was he was ashamed. No. Um I'm I I'm not ashamed of what what you know telling my children that you know I was almost a vegan is not mean about shame. Telling them that I used to use drugs mm -hmm. is not a shame. What I have concerns with mm -hmm. is the fact that how they might take it from the sun from this place of maybe well daddy daddy smoke and drink can he give over maybe i can smoke and drink and give over too hmm. you understand it's from that place i am looking at i am not looking at shame because but even it's not shame dion huh? it's not shame dion but it's fair it's fair as I tell them. <laughs> um, you see, I understand what you're saying, and I w always felt that I should tell them. But when he said that to me, it had me thinking. And when he explained mm. to me what he meant, I say, you know, that makes sense too. Mm. You know, telling them before someone else, telling them, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Right? They are my children. My wife knows my past. She knows yeah. everything. Yeah. I never heard anything from her. Yeah. I have been on the TV, TV6 News. I've been there. But then your children could see that too. Right. And they could see it. So there's nothing for me to be shame about or to hide. Yeah. But um, I was just playing around with it and looking at it from this place. If you tell him, boy, that used to really drink and smoke and thing, you know, he may or may not. Right, I have to use me or me not. He may or may not see it as or glorify or look at it as boy, daddy, do that. Let me do that too. Maybe I might stop. Maybe I might not stop. That's how I see it for them. But for me, telling them is no problem. I don't have a problem telling my children anything. I wouldn't hide anything from them. I never hid anything from my wife, no, my mother, or anybody. I just don't want them to take it the wrong way and think that they could go and do it too because they don't know how they're going to end up. I am telling you, I have seen guys who have been in the rehab with, I know one guy, he lost his hands. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you that video of him in the hospital. He went in the rehab with me. Um, yeah. He lost his two hands get, trying to get breadfruit to smoke drugs. No way. Some of them died. Some of them in prison right now. Some of them still using. It's just a handful of us came out successful. Wow. So I'm I'm not saying that I'm saying all of that to say that I don't want my children to think that it's okay to use drugs. Yeah. You know, some children take things the wrong way. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's 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 all on me to to explain to them to show them. Listen, this is what your daddy did, and this is what you shouldn't do. Hmm. Still, you didn't make them mind. So you know, um, I don't you mind. Could show them the them. consequences. You could show them the consequences yes. and tell and give them the decision. You have to make a decision as to what you want for your life because they'll find out and they'll be exposed to it anyway. Anyhow, you take it. Yes, but once yes. they're mature, once they're mature enough to understand, you know. I then, I then yes, we could have a man-to-man -man conversation. A conversation, that's it, a yes, conversation. So it's not like yes. you're trying to tell them what to do, but show them the consequences. Mm -hmm, so that they yes. now, you you show your trust in them, that you trust daddy, trust you to make the right decision. Yes, yes. You know, so it's how you bring it across. You, know, you have to use the psychology too on it, right? Yes, you know, yes, yes. because they're smart but, um, for so. The policeman, I think, um, you know, police, he, he probably just probably a little overprotective of his children. And um, like you said, shame.
because I know some of the things that he used to do, we did them together. You understand? So I know you wouldn't want to go and tell your children, boy, I used to make women and we used to go and do this and do that to them. And you, you, you wouldn't want to do that. You understand? So I understand him and I understand in nature of the beast, I also understand mm -hmm. that having an open relationship with your children is very, yes. very important. Very important. And yeah. hopefully God will lead me to having that conversation with them. But you I know, think that's so, best. Yeah, that's best. Yeah. Just be led by the Holy Spirit. As you said, you you you, you don't do anything without him. And I think that's no. the smartest, that's the smartest move anybody could make. <laughs> Honestly, can't go wrong there. And so how do you teach your children? Um, to have self-control. I mean, how do you teach your sons to take control over their emotions and their passions? I mean, the Bible says a lot about our passions and the lusts of the flesh and, and, and all of these things. How do you teach them anyway without bringing up your past? How do you teach them to, to be self-controlled? It's by example. Okay. First thing is by example, and I think it's the most important thing and the only thing that I could actually think about is by example and having conversation. Um, and the only way to do that, to have the perfect example or not, let me, let me use the word perfect, but have great example is by being led by the Holy Spirit. And when you are led by the Holy Spirit, you'll get angry, but you will not get aggressive right you will have the right temperament right personality to have the right conversation with them and it's 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 about it's about the most high god it's not about anything else because for me i get vexed quick 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 and cost you out but when you are led by the holy spirit it, 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 it tempers you for example driving sometimes i get angry Sometimes I curse, but then I ask for forgiveness immediately. So it's a practice. You understand? It's a yeah. practice. So yes, I'll get angry, I'll ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And that is the steps that you have to start taking in order to develop the kind of personality you want. So that by the time I train, while they're growing, they're growing with to meeting a groomed father. Not yeah. a, arrogant father now looking to change yeah you understand so to deal with your children you have to be led by the holy spirit otherwise mm -hmm. you're going to curse them you're going to talk to them rough you're going to rough them up and you wouldn't get across the message right so you, so it starts with you and an example be the example right that's that's the best thing that's the best thing that you can do because they want you want your children to um to look up to you you want them to say i want to be like daddy when I grew up and, you know, I ask um, a lot of the guys around my area, do you want your children to grow up to be like you? Could you, I mean, if we were to ask every man that we meet, every father that we meet, do you want your children to grow up to be just like you? I wonder what would be their response. And if they say no, why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why not? I think that's something to ponder. Yeah. Do um, you want your children to grow up to be like you? More, coming from the block, coming from the streets, I would say 90% will say no. Because if I had children while I were on the block, I would tell them no. I don't want my children to come on the block. I don't want my children to sell drugs. Yeah. I don't want my children to have multiple girlfriends that are AIDS. I didn't get it, but that are all kind of these sexual transmitted diseases yes. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want them to be a womanizer. I wouldn't want them to do all them things. I want them to go to school, get their education, get the distinctions, go off to college, have nice wives, start to build a house young. They mustn't want to be building a house like old like me and, and that kind of thing. So I would I would say no. I would say no. I don't want my children sitting on the block smoking weed and their mouth black, their, their heel black, their fingernails dirty, they're not cutting their fingernails. No. And, you know, it's a good question. It's a good conversation piece, I'm, I'm thinking, so that it will start them thinking. It's not to condemn, it's not to bring condemnation. Huh? Mm -hmm. It is to bring a realization as to your situation. 
But I'll exactly. tell you the truth. Yeah. That conversation will only stay at the surface because the next smoke or the next bottle of rum it gone. Wow, it's that. It's gone, it's I mean, gone. this is serious stuff. Yeah, because um, what addiction tells you is that the addict places the welfare, places drugs over the welfare of his wife, his family, and his his well being. Wow. So yes, the, the madam sent it down the road. Yeah. To, to buy food. Oh, Your wife sent it down the road to buy food. But you're a gambler. You go on and you gamble out the food money. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? <laughs> so you place the welfare of the addiction in front of the you place the use of the addiction or the drug in front of the welfare of your family. Okay. And well, cocaine addicts. They leave, they leave home and live on the streets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Alcoholics, they go home and they drink all they drink out all the money. I remember my, my mother telling me um, my father was a crack cooking at the can. He gave us six hundred dollars to make groceries. Okay. He went and he smoked out his money, uh -huh. came back home and stole the money from her. That was the oh. bank. Yeah. Oh wow. So, so answering that question is so in a serious, but remember if the seed doesn't fall on fertile soil, what will happen? Right. You know? Right, right. Oh gosh, you know, I could continue. <laughs> I, this is such an important um, topic. I could, I could continue talking to you for a, a whole other hour, but our time is up. I'm so sorry. Um, but I really want to say thank you so much, Mr. D'Souza, for being with us this evening. And I just want to remind persons that they can find Changing Lanes on Facebook. Yes. Um, and is there anything you'd want to say to addicts right now, Mr. Mr. D'Souza? If you have, you, have the, you have this platform, what would you say to persons who are in the throes of addiction right now? Is there anything that you can say? There's nothing that you can do to help yourself. You need to seek help. Most of us, we are most of us while we are in addiction, we live in denial. We live in, in the past, in the part that says, I can do it, I can do it. But yeah. the truth and the fact is, we can't do it on our own. We need help. Yeah. And and um there's no guarantee how you're gonna stop. Some people stop because they lost the two hands, some people stop because they died. My father wow. stopped because his lungs collapsed. Wow. He had to do it from an oxygen machine. Oh Otherwise, goodness. he would not have stopped. Yeah. I know a guy, he stopped because his heart started giving him problems. Yeah. So be smart. Don't start for those of you who have never used drugs. And for yeah. those of you who are in active addiction, yeah. seek rehabilitation centers, seek help, speak to someone, have conversation, and pray. And pray. All yeah. right. So that's a good, that's a good point to end on. Thank you so much again, Mr. D'Souza. And thank you so much, Growth Radio listeners, for listening to us, for being with us this evening. Um, we're here again next Friday, please God, on Interview with the Exes. And stay with us, you know, stay with us and tell a friend, tell a friend to listen in. So thank you again, Mr. D'Souza. Thank you again, Growth Radio listeners, for being with us. Until next time, have a wonderful weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> Growth Radio is growing with a new program, Interview with the Exes, Ex-Man, Ex-Woman, Ex-Minor Woman, Ex-Husband, Ex-Wife, Ex. Every Friday evening, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time, GrowthRadioTT.com. Growth Radio. Exes, Ex-Dad, ex yada Ex. To the saints, the table has been set, so take your place. There is no more condemnation, there is only grace. World Radio Gospel Radio, our way to heaven. We are sentinels of the king. We are of the king. We are Radio Gospel Radio. 
our way to hell. One king and one kingdom making people feel like family. 